And then turn tonight to Mark chapter number 8, and verse number 34. I'll just reiterate again tonight that if anybody wants any firewood, connect with Brother Doug. I'm taking charge of that right now, that tree down. Amen. And uh, looking forward to getting it out off the, uh, off the premises. Amen. And uh, you can take it and you can uh, stay warm with it this coming winter. Praise God. I know I'm going to read a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I want to share some challenging thoughts that challenge me with you this evening. And uh, leave your Bibles open because I'm going to jump back and read it again uh, once I give you a little bit of introductory information. But Mark chapter number 8, verse number 34, the Word of God says, And when He called uh, the people unto Him with His disciples also, He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. We're looking at Memorial Day 2017. If I could, I'd like to take you back a lot of years. Could I take you back to the year 1860? And uh, it, the setting is in Washington, D.C., the nation was plunged in a civil war, north against south. The civil war was real. It was being fought uh, violently. Uh, uh, it, there was just brother shedding blood of brother. Can you imagine that, Brother Craig? I mean, it's just hard to wrap your mind around the civil war. And uh, so within the nation's capital there in Washington, D.C., on New York Avenue set a church called the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. It was actually known to many as the Church of the President. In fact, it was there in this church, Sister Beth, where Dwight D. Eisenhower felt the Spirit of God tug on, tug on his heart, Brother Eli, to make a change to the pledge to the American flag and add two words to it. And those words would be, one nation, Two words, under God. So here in this church, uh, God had spoken to the heart of, uh, of Dwight D. Eisenhower. It was during the years of the Civil War that the church's pulpit was filled with a man. Uh, and his name was uh, uh, Dr. Phineas Densmore Gurley. And Dr. Phineas Dinsmore Gurley uh, was pastor of, of the church here, uh, 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 the Presbyterian Church there on New York Avenue, as it's set just blocks away from the White House. He was also chaplain to the U.S. Senate, so he had a lot of responsibility. Uh, but one thing that uh, was happening during this time was uh, in office was a president by the name of, does anyone know? Abraham Lincoln, that's correct. And so Abraham Lincoln was advised by his counselors that he should find himself a church and that he should attend it and he should find a church where the president or that the pastor was a bit aloof from politics and really didn't bring politics into uh, the message. And so there he began to attend the church where uh, Phineas Dinsmore Gurley was the pastor. It was Phineas who would be the one that would walk with him as he lost his young son, Willie. And uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln and his wife were just crazed with grief. It, was, it would be uh, uh, Pastor Gurley who, who would be the one who would give them words of comfort and, and, and would advise. It would be that same pastor who would hold uh, Abraham Lincoln in his arms when he was dying in a theater and he would minister to him. He would be the same pastor who would be the one who would share the words uh, at Abraham Lincoln's funeral and he would be the same one that would journey with the remains of Abraham Lincoln as he was buried in Springfield, Illinois. Now I've said a lot of information but there's a, a reason for that because I want to get to a point it was there where uh, Abraham Lincoln and his wife would 
within church. And so Sister Nancy, particularly one Sunday as, as they were going to church, the president would sit in the pastor's office. He wouldn't sit out in the congregation. And the door of the office would be open. And he would hear what the pastor would have to say. And he would also have a, a, a gaze straight at the platform where he could see the pastor as he delivered his message. And so uh, one evening, one of the, uh, uh, the president's advisors uh, was going on a walk with the president after they had sat and listened to the sermon. And so uh, the, the advisor asked, he said, so tell me, what do you think about Pastor Phineas's message? Do you think that it was a great message? Abraham Lincoln replied, he said, no, I, I, I don't think. It was a great message. It was a good message. But it was not a great message. Because Pastor Gurley forgot to ask us to do something great. So therefore, it was a good message for the baby. He studied very long before he put time into it. He delivered it very well, Brother Eli. But he did not challenge us as a church to do something great for God. Wow. Wow, Brother David. That can fix my heart. As much as you want everything to be lined up, and as much as you want to give good information, and as much as you want it to catch the ears of all your hearers, if we fail as a pastor, to give a challenge to do something great, then we failed as a pastor. So I must say this, please forgive me in the moments that I failed, but I hope tonight will not be one of those moments, but I hope that I can challenge you to do something great. The Word of God is full of men who are challenged to do something great. Do you remember a man named Joseph? Now Joseph, he was betrayed by his brethren. You know the story. We know his, 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 his falling down, but then God begins to lift him up and fulfills the dream that he was given. What an amazing story of Joseph. Remember this, that once Jacob has gone off the scene, uh, 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 he's dead. Joseph's brothers were convinced that, that brother David, that Joseph was going to be out to get them and do something to them. So they did something. They said, Joseph, would you you would you even though we, we, we sold you into slavery uh, even though uh, we laughed at you and scorned you would, would you forgive us wow asking something great you just changed the whole course of a man's life you, 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 you just devastated what he thought would be. And now you've challenged him to do something. Uh, let me tell you this. Forgiveness is a very hard thing to do for others. And it's very easy to do it ourselves. Amen. We can forgive ourselves very easily of, of things that we've done. We know ourselves well. But it's hard to forgive others. But Joseph, the man that he was, he did not withhold forgiveness. He said, how could the God who's with me, amen, if he's willing to forgive me, how can I not forgive you? So something great asks. How about a man named Joshua talk about doing something great? Joshua was in battle against the enemy and the other day was coming to an end and Joshua didn't know anything about astronomy. He didn't know too much about the alignment of the planets. He didn't know nothing about the stars, the moon, in great detail. But one thing Joshua did is this. He said, God, would you just allow the sun to stand still even though it was a difficult thing to do, even though it was a great thing to ask. He had confidence and not in the universe round about him, but he had confidence in the God of the universe who could stop the, uh, the, the, the sun from, from going down, the moon from coming up. Amen. Do something great. That's what Joshua did. It was Elisha that was there when, uh, when he said, I want a double portion. Uh, Elijah said that was a great thing and that he asked for. It. And if he saw God take him, amen, the great thing would be done. It was. But of all the great things and the great challenges that are asked, Brother David, I believe the greatest challenge 
is given by Jesus Christ. Right here in Mark chapter number 8, verse number 34. And when he had called the people unto him and his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Of all the words, of all the challenges, the most challenging comes from the living word. And that is Jesus Christ, the word of God in flesh, as he challenges us to take up our cross. Come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross. Listen, he wasn't talking to Peter, he wasn't talking to Timothy, he wasn't talking to Paul. He was talking to whosoever, and that whosoever is you and die. And the challenge is great tonight, that whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and let him take up his cross and follow me. Jesus wasn't talking about the latest statistics of the ball game. He wasn't talking about Wall Street. He wasn't talking about what was happening on the fox hunt. Uh, he, he was talking about something that was much more great. Amen. He was dealing with the root of our discontent. And our discontentment can only be found in when we take up our cross, we deny ourselves, and we follow Him. Amen. That is when we find real contentment. Amen. Jesus never played games with His followers. It shouldn't surprise us. Amen. He doesn't conceal the cost of, uh, of discipleship. He never hides what it takes. Amen. He said, to, he said Peter, there's something places you want to go, you won't go. Paul, there's things that you're going to suffer for the kingdom of heaven. And he said to, to the rich young ruler who came to me, he said, you must sell everything if you want to have eternal life. That means the pearl of great price. Amen. It will cost a great price. The field, if you want it, amen, it will cost you everything that you have. You see, I believe that when we follow Jesus Christ, I think that, that, that He gives us some warning signs. He said, only the committed will pass by this way. God is looking for men and women who will be committed in leadership and discipleship and following Him. If you look, you'll find that in the book of John, chapter number 6, Crowd all leaders, they're hungry. Sometimes the belly dictates a lot of things about this body, doesn't it? Brother David, sometimes I get hungry. Amen. Brother Doug, I hope I'm never so hungry that I leave the feet of Jesus. God help me. God help us that we're willing to deny ourselves as we follow Him and take Him across. cross. Not just one day a week, not a certain season of life, but for now and for always. Can I say it again? Not just a day of the week, not a season of life, but for now and for always. That we will deny ourselves and we will take up our cross. Amen. You may say, but, but Brother Seville, that just doesn't seem like normal. I need to tell you tonight, Christianity is anything but the norm. Amen. God doesn't expect us to fit into the world's normal. Amen. It will never be fashionable. It will never make the front pages of the magazines. Amen. But God still calls us, amen, to take up our cross and to follow after Him. There were two Moverian men, and uh, they heard of a, a distant island in the West Indies where a man owned the whole island, and he, he was a plantation owner. And he had slaves, and he did not allow his slaves to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. These two Moravian Mar 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 men, their heart was broken. So as they were gripped, Brother David, by the fact that there were hundreds of slaves who weren't allowed to hear about Jesus Christ, Brother Justin, they decided that they would sell themselves into slavery. So that's exactly what they did, Sister Tina. They sold themselves as a slave to this plantation owner. They took the money, they bought their tickets, and they went to this island, and they gave their life sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Their families came to the doctor, bid them goodbye, uh, uh, knowing that they would say farewell and that they would probably never lay eyes upon them again. And what was heard echoing over the water as they said goodbye to their family members, uh, these two young men, they said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. I wonder if our life, amen, exemplifies that motto. May the lamb that was slain, amen, receive uh, the reward of his suffering. On that Moravian island, it is said that 2,158 men and women gave their lives to be missionaries because that was the message that was preached on the Moravian island. May the lamb that was slain, that slain receive the reward of his suffering. I wonder if that's how our life is. Amen. I wonder if the lamb that was slain, amen, receives the reward of his suffering in you and I. I'm talking about taking up our cross and following after Jesus Christ. Tonight, the message that I pray will give you a great challenge, amen, that will give you a great opportunity to do something greater in your life. May God be glorified. You see, when Jesus He died for us, Amen. He gave everything. He desires for us to give everything. You may say, but doing God's will and paying the price, forsaking family and friends and loved ones—that's not the norm. Let me share a little story with you. I didn't intend to share this tonight. I was talking to my mom recently. My mom said to me, she said, you know, the church isn't what I remember it being. She said, your dad and I when we were raising you kids. Above any other thing that was going on, the church was not bad. We missed lots and lots and lots of we felt that we need to be faithful. Because we want our children to love and know God. I look back and I think, ah, don't they? Thank God for a mom and dad who did not himself to cut the cross. You know, I remember Sister Tina and my dad working these rotating shifts. Sister Rachel, one week he worked the shift, the next week, second shift, the next week, third shift, and then Brother Justin, the fourth week he worked a floor and he worked two days of each of them. I remember he farmed our land. We had cattle, Sister Nancy, we had to work around making hay uh, when, when the sun was shining. But my dad worked his sleep schedule with every schedule around the church. Because he was challenged to take up the cross, fall on the Challenged not a fresh and a new. Well, Justin is a Bible school student, I can pray it, but now 25 years later. Amen. It has to be the reality that today I'm willing to deny myself as much as I did back then. But I'm able to take up my cross and follow after Jesus because the call has not changed. The challenge is still great. Do something great for God in your life. One translation of this verse says, and I, I, I try to I, I share this, not to get you reading a different translation, but it was just interesting to me. If, uh, Philip's translation says, if anyone wants to follow in my footsteps, he must give up all rights to himself, take it up his cross, and follow me. Amen. The world is fixed on rights. But it's my right. It's my right. Let me tell you, when we serve Christ, it's not about our rights. We give them all up. Amen. It's not about what I want, but it's about what he wants. Amen. It's not about uh, 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 rights uh, because I'm a servant. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't have a right to anything anymore. I don't have a right to be offended, so I can't be offended. I don't have a right to be hurt, so I have to let go of the hurt. I don't have
have a right to hold on to, to grudges and resentment. I, I don't have the right to put other people down. I don't have the right to get involved in all the cares of life because I gave up my rights to follow Him. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Amen. Your cross is a cross. Each one of us has a cross. Can you simply say to yourself today, yeah. my cross. My cross. I, I don't want to offend anybody. Some people, you know, they may look and say, well, that person's sick. That's their cross to bear in life. I, I understand part of that. But God calls them to a cross that is much greater than their sin. Well, they've been poor all their life. That's the cross they've been called to bear. I, I, I think the call of the cross is not poverty, but it's following after Christ. And so, taking up our cross to suffer affliction for His name's sake, taking up our cross to show everyone who we love, taking up our cross for others so that they can meet the great conquest of the great in the cross. The church at Sardis, they had a name and they were great. But the Word of God says that Jesus had some odd against them because they were dead. Take up our cross. It causes us to have faith that has works. It causes us to have love that will sacrifice. It causes us to have worship that causes us to wash and sanctify ourselves. It's taking up the cross. It doesn't matter if someone says, I have a name that I live. Listen, in some ways I feel bad for you, in other ways I feel great, and hopefully this is a challenge, but I deal with people dying all the time. It's, 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 it's part of my profession, Brother David. On every angle, I deal with it all the time. Some young, some old. But most tell me that they have things that they wish they would have changed. They're concerned about where they'll spend eternity. I'm not talking about folks who are sinners and terrible people. I'm talking about people who have been religious all their life, but they've never learned to be challenged to do something great by taking up the cross of Jesus Christ. Some time ago, there was a businessman and he was wanting to buy a, a big property with a warehouse on it. Brother Justin, and he came and he looked at the warehouse. It was ran down. It was trice. There was no doors on it. There was windows that was broken. There was trice everywhere. The man said that I want to buy. I want to buy that 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 that, that building. And so the owner said, would you like me to fix it up? Or, or would you like to do something? Uh, what, what do you want me to do to that good? And, and the buyer said, I don't want you to do anything. I want the building as is because I'm not leaving it as it is. I'm going to put a different building on there and do something great. Can I tell you that's the way God looks at us? He doesn't want us to fix ourselves. He doesn't want us to manage our time agenda. He doesn't want us to wash ourselves or change ourselves or create good habits. He wants us to give ourselves to Him as we are and then take up our cross and follow Him. Deny Him. Because he wants to make something greater and better of you. This evening, if I had a $50 bill in my hand and I picked it up and I said, Who wants this $50 bill? Would anyone want it? I'm going to give $50 away. Would you want it? Uh, amen. Thank you, Brother David. Your, your Pentecostal, the rest of these here, I don't know what they're doing. Can you repeat with me? Uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> Every one of you would want that fifty dollars, wouldn't you? Every one of you, even the banker would want it. <laughs> Every one of you, you know. Let me ask you this: If I took that fifty dollars and I crumbled it up, and I said, "Would you still want it? Would you still want it?" Yeah. What if I took it and I stomped it under my foot and I twisted on it, maybe got a little bit of rip and tear? And would you still want it? 
You would. You know why? Because it doesn't matter what the appearance of it looks like. It has a signature on it that it is backed by the U.S. Treasury and it is worth $50 in our economy. And so the value of it is great. Can I tell you that no matter what our life looks like, amen, God looks and He sees the value of it. Whether you're living in the 11th hour of life or whether you're a young person, amen, God looks at you and He says, your life has value and I want to take it I want to change it around I want to do something great with it it's interesting there was a family their name were, were Bordens it was back in the late 1800s early 1900s and uh, they had earned a, a, a fortune in, in their silver mines so they had a young son, and his name was Will, and uh, they had sent him to private school, and they had sent him to Yale College and to seminary at Princeton, and, and, and the Bordens wanted their son to be successful and, and, and whatever it was in life because uh, they, they, had, they had money. And so it was Will at the age of seven, he said that God told him that he had great things for his life. And Will said, and I told God, whatever you have for me, I will do. So while he was in college, he ministered to sailors. After graduation, he became a missionary to China. At the age of 25, he took a visit to Egypt to be a missionary. And there, he contracted meningitis. And he died at the age Inscribed in his tombstone is this William Borden, 1887 to 1913. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for this. Will's mother read this to him on a regular basis. It was a poem that was written. Almost daily, it is said that she read to him, Just as I am, thy own to be, friend of the young who loves me. To consecrate myself to thee, O Jesus Christ, come. In the glad morning of my day, my life to give my vows to pay. With no reserve and no delay, with all my heart to come. I would ever live in the light. I would ever work for the right. I would ever serve thee with all my might. Therefore to thee I come. Just as I am, young, strong, and free, to be the best that I can be for truth and righteousness and thee. Lord of my life, I come. Our life is to be lived not as our own, but to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow Jesus. It will never be a fashionable message. It will never be a fashionable person. But it is a challenge to be the greatest that you can be. Listen, God has not called us to be a tourist in this life. He's called us to be a pilgrim. He calls us and He wants us to respond greatly. I started out telling you that Dr. Phineas Dinsmore more girly was the pastor of that Presbyterian church. And Abraham Lincoln said it was a good message for not a great message because it did not lead to the church. It did not have a call to be or do something great. In Pastor Gurley's memoirs, it is written, that this is what he said to President Abraham Lincoln's people. Let our principal anxiety now be that this new sorrow may be a sanctified sorrow. That it may lead us 
to deeper repentance, to a more humbling sense of our dependence upon God, and to the more unreserved consecration of ourselves in all that we have. An unreserved consecration. For the man who actually was there in the theater where President Abraham Lincoln was killed, he actually used that later as an illustration of preach against the theater. Very interesting. There he was. He gave words to the grieving Abraham Lincoln and his wife as they lost their son Willie. Grieving. He was there as he gave the eulogy.